The music is gone. Hello. I see a lot of people joining Facebook Live. And so thank you so much for showing up. Hi, that's me. Everybody give a kind welcome and hello to Mr. Larkin Rose and Howdy. Mr. Hody Johns. What's up, fellas? There's ladies too. Don't just say fellows. And gals, but they're already here for Larkin. <laughs> so I don't need to, they don't need me. Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so it takes a few minutes on Facebook Live for people to join and get engaged. So I thought we would have a very uh, friendly, a uh, few minutes of banter, and maybe we could talk a little bit about what we're talking about tonight, which would be anarchism and voting. I've been on both sides of this issue before as an anarchist. And so I picked you all, and you were gracious enough to um, agree to this debate because I think you're both very articulate and have well-formed arguments. And honestly, who wants to argue with an idiot? And so... Um, <laughs> I would, I'm going to bounce to Hody first while we're just doing these introductions and letting people join. Um, Hody, tell me a little bit about yourself. About me? Sure. So mm -hmm. I am Hody Johns. I am a host on the We Are Libertarians podcast and network. Uh, I do the daily shows out there. I've been on the main show before. Uh, we just have a lot of fun. We cast a wide net. We're, we are focused on bring in as many of those little fractions as possible into the movement. And we have anarchists and minarchists and libertarian socialists and, and just really what? whatever is bot bottom Love unity socks. against the authority. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, say what we will about them. The thing is, is if you're against authority, this is an alliance that we kind of need. And um, gotcha. that that's kind of where we stand. And uh, I, me personally, that's just really what I'm all about is that unity is recognizing that there's always going to be somebody smarter than you that believes something different than you. And that means they have some value in the conversation. And we can't just win by intellectual Bas bashing heads because if we look at the top 10 people of all time in intellect, they differ with each other greatly uh, as far as perspectives, but they're, they're really good at doing is understanding one another. And so that understanding is, I think, what's going to help lift us out of uh, a lot of the authority. Um, as far as me personally, speech and debate is really my background. Uh, I, we had, I went to Liberty University. We won national championships three in a row while I was there. Um, don't read too much into it. They also won three years in a row after I left, but, uh, it's a really good program. <laughs> it's a really good program regardless. And, uh, I'm just, I'm just proud to be here. Um, happy to be talking to a guy that I have talked about often. And this is, uh, Larkin Rose and it's probably his turn. Yes, absolutely. So thank you, Hody. And I appreciate that. And I think um, I agree with a lot of your points, even though I'm not a minarchist. I think um, you make some really good points about that. So I'm going to throw it over to Larkin, who a lot of people probably know you from a lot of your authorship and things like that. 
So what would you say as an introduction of yourself in light of this um, discussion that we're going to be having about voting? Well, I've been an opinionated loudmouth for many, 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 many years and accidentally became an anarchist when I realized I could not be consistent with myself um, and still cling to any form of statism. And I, I even have old mm -hmm. things I wrote. One thing was the God called government where I was so close and just didn't get it. And now I want to go back in time and debate myself and argue with myself. Um, and then along <laughs> the way, I wrote, um, first I wrote how to be a successful tyrant and, and uh, the iron web and the most dangerous superstition and have done a zillion videos and stuff. Um, and to me, it, it's a little bit weird because while a lot of people sort of expect philosophy to be all highbrow and sophisticated, I sort of feel like my job is to state the bleeding obvious in a way that any five-year-old can understand it. Because in this case, when it comes to, to politics, the truth is actually pretty painfully simple in a lot of ways. And the thing that makes it complicated is the massive pile of political mythology we were all taught that makes this jumbled mess that you have to dig through to find a very simple truth. Um, I agree that lots of people can disagree about a bunch of different things and still be an intelligent and, and have respectable conversations. The thing is to me, politics, it's either, it's one or the other, it's digital, it's not analog. I either own, my, okay. own myself or I am the property of some collective or some majority or something else. If I own myself, government is inherently illegitimate if I don't, I'm a slave and then I'm just sort of whining for the slave master to be nice to me, whether it's a collective or anything else. Um, so I don't, when it comes to the unity thing, that might come up in the, some in the debate. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to unify with anybody who wants me violently dominated. I want to convince as many people as possible to leave me alone and I'll leave them alone. And that's the only way to get to actual peaceful coexistence. Okay, well, you already am like, uh you're spurring some really cool arguments that I might have um, to throw back and forth to you and Hody too, because um, personally, well, number one, folks, before we get into this debate, I am not Gwen Eiffel. I know we look like twins, but I am not. So I have an opinion. I chose these gentlemen because I respect them and I think they're intellectual. Um, but I definitely am not going to give this like completely blank slated, although she doesn't, she's pretty much, she's a statist and a leftist. But anyways, I'm not going to give you a really um, dry debate. I want some fun and some interaction. And so what I'm going to do, folks, I'm seeing some of your comments. I have an outline of what I want to ask in the debate. Some really common arguments about voting, anarchism, libertarianism. But if you have a really cool question, I would love to ask it of the guys. So um, please stop messaging me during this. <laughs> um, I will definitely ask it. So what I'm going to do, I think we have some pretty good engagement now. New comments. Oh, yeah, we have a lot of comments. Um, <laughs> wow. So I am going to just give a quick intro about um, Hody and Larkin. And obviously this can be rewatched, re um, not live. So hopefully if you are just catching this live, go back to the beginning later on and watch this. So first of all, I am a fan of both of these gentlemen. So Larkin, I want to give a little bit of information about him. Um, Larkin is an internationally known vocal advocate for the principles of self-ownership, non-aggression, and a stateless society. In other words, voluntarism. I think most of you are familiar with that term. Mr. Rose is the author of several books, including The Most Dangerous Superstition, which is probably his most well-known and the most that I got messages about. Lord, I got many quotes about your book in my uh, messenger. <laughs> and The Iron Web, as well as many hundreds of articles and has performed in dozens of public <clears throat> Uh, forums, debate, and seminars, and has produced hundreds of videos, including The Tiny Dot, which is, I'm a fan of, <laughs> The King, and It Can Happen Here. So um, Larkin's pretty well known in the anarchist community, um, but I'll give you a little shout out to Hody. Um, some of you might not be as familiar with him, uh, but I would let you know that Hody is not a hack that I just pulled out of the internet. Um, <laughs> so here's a little bit of information about Hody. Cody Johns is a writer and podcaster based in Ogden, Utah. 
He is a host on We Are Libertarian Network. His articles, speeches, and work have been featured in campaigns across the country, including those of Larry Sharp. I love me some Larry boy. Um, and Craig Bowden. Hody graduated from Liberty University with a degree in theology. You can find him at um, facebook.com slash the Um So uh, Hody actually is a de national debate champion. So I would not pick any kind of weak statist to debate Larkin. <laughs> we need someone of, of strong mind. Oh, look. There's people, there's people already saying, like, go so-and-so. People are already dividing and picking teams, and they haven't even heard questions yet. So, like I said, this is going to be a loose debate forum. Um, I'm the uh, not uh, PBS moderator. I have a beer here. I'm going to be drinking it and enjoying this. So, the first question that I'm going to pose, and you'll have a time limit, and then I'll uh, throw it back to the other person. I'm going to pose this to you, Larkin. I cannot recall a single case in history whereby a government has refused to rule a country because the number of people voting was not high enough. How do you think less people voting would affect change? I can recall dozens of cases. I'll use the American Revolution. The American <laughs> Revolution, which unfortunately just created a new ruling class because the people are still statist, it ended British rule not by voting, not by petitioning. In fact, they nicely wrote the Declaration of Independence, which listed all the things they had tried before, which didn't freaking work. And then what they did was say, you're not the boss of us. We, ha we are not beholden to you. You are not any legitimate authority over us. If you try to rule us by force, we will resist by force. And they did, and they won. And since then, Americans have voted and petitioned and campaigned and made parties and campaigned harder and voted harder and went downhill for over 200 years in a row, demonstrating that even when libertarianism starts at the finish line, which is what the US Constitution was, it was as close to minicrism as you mm. can get, even when they yeah. start at the finish line, <laughs> if you start voting at the finish line, you will end up with the biggest authoritarian empire in the history of the world with the biggest war machine in the history of the world and the biggest extortion racket in the history of the world. So yeah, voting goes backwards. Actual disobedience is the only thing that ends empires. Okay, I'm gonna to toss that over to you, Hody. So the original question was, I cannot recall a single case in history whereby a government has refused to rule a country because of the number of people voting. I think you listened to Larkin's argument, so what say you in response? Sure. Well, first thing, let's address the idea that uh, constitutional republics are the highest rate of like oppression and murder of all time. That's a fun like, you know, hockey puck slap shot to throw out there, the mid-court shot. And, you know, you say it goes in and you turned around and you turn around, you look at history and all oh, cred, it didn't go in at all. R.J. Rummel, who studied <laughs> and coined the term democide, uh, found that governments were responsible for murdering 262 million people in the last century alone. So it's nothing to shrug at, right? He expanded on Robert Conquest's more conservative models um, that found that liberal democracies have much less democide than authoritarian regimes. Um, his study was peer reviewed and, uh, and then approved. And in the approval of the peers, uh, they noted that democratic norms and political structures contain elite decisions and uh, the use of repression against their citizens, whereas autocratic elites are not so constrained. Uh, once in place, democratic institutions, even partial ones, reduce the likelihood of armed conflict and all but eliminate the risk that it will lead to genocide and uh, politicide. Now, not these things happen, but we're talking about a great deal of reduction. And just simply the numbers alone, let's look at, let's look at the last hundred years. Um, the ones that killed the most people, you had the Chinese communism, uh, which was authoritarian, killed um, 80.8 uh, six million people. The Soviet Un Union killed uh, 82 or 62 million, and Nazi Germany killed 21 million people. So, so these ideas that we are under a constitutional republic are somehow worse than these dictators and these other autocracies is something that I would reject flatly. Um, and that's how I'd answer that. Okay, I'm going to throw a rebuttal back to you, Larkin. What say you on the uh, Hody's point of less numbers on the side of the people, uh, democracy? The worst the most murderous regime in history, the People's Republic of China was a constitutional republic which allowed their people to vote and had a bill of rights. 
The Union of Soviet Socialist Republics was a constitutional republic that allowed their people to vote and had a Bill of Rights. The Weimar Republic was a constitutional republic that allowed their people to vote until the con and had a Bill of Rights until the Constitution included that piece that said, if things get really bad, you can just override civil rights. All of the mass murdering regimes you just listed were constitutional democratic republics with a Bill of Rights. And you can say, well, they weren't really. Well, nothing is really. But on paper, if you look at their constitutions, they are very similar. In fact, modeled after, in a large part, the US Constitution, because they realized if you pretend to be representing people, you can get away with a lot more than if you just say, we're your masters. Now, for RJ Rummel to say, well, these count as democratic and these count as, as authoritarian is completely arbitrary. If you read the constitutions of all three, those three horrible tyrannies, and there are many more, including Democratic People's Republic of North Korea, you see they were all modeled after the same structure. They were all constitutional republics that all pretended to represent the people, pretended to respect individual rights and the right to free speech, and the right to assembly and all these things. You just gave three examples of democratically elected constitutional republics with bills of rights that were the three most oppressive regimes in the history of the world. So I'm gonna take a Larkin's statement there. So what he is doing is essentially, and I think we could probably all agree, saying that a constitutional republic does not is not specific to the United States or to maybe some other country that has formed some constitutional republic by a way of a constitution or whatever. What say you in response to him? Sure, it's a simple Wikipedia search. You can find out who's unitary uh, or who's a federalist wing where they can override the people. Now, I grant what he's saying, a lot of them fake it, right? They put it on paper. Mm -hmm. For me, I always think this is the fat person ordering pizza, right? I want the seven cheese pizza with the cheese stuffed crusts with extra cheese and cheese on the crust. Mm -hmm. And I get, to, can I get some Parmesan cheese in the packets, right? And this is what Republic is when you're when you're a dictator, right? You say, oh, I want a Republic with some extra Republicness with some democracy on there. And we're super all about the people, right? But ultimately, when you design a system of government, that actually is very concrete, and that is the specific thing that you can list. So when they list themselves as unitary or as federalist, where they can suspend all the bills of rights, so they have these constitutions that they can suspend um, at any time, then that actually is a specific thing. So that's that's you got the guys okay. who fake it, and you got the guys who make it. So I'm going to go off my script here and respond with a question to Larkin about what you just said. What is the difference between someone that can um, alter or abolish a constitution and the United States government doing the same thing? Larkin, to you. Uh, the only one of the ones I listed that had that provision was the Weimar Republic, which Hitler made use of that provision that said, well, we can suspend some of these individual rights in case of an emergency. Soviet Union and China did not have for such a provision and never used such a provision. They just ignored the limitations kind of like the United States government has in the, oh, every single year of its entire history. So to say that, well, on paper, they're supposed to do this, when in every single country it's ever been tried, they never stick to what they're supposed to do, and they absolutely always violate the individual rights, including the individual rights that their constitutions specifically say they're not allowed to violate. It's the, the Constitution is just scribbles on toilet paper. It doesn't stop anything. It's illegitimate to begin with, and the only part of it that lasts through time is the imaginary authority that it pretends to create, whereas the imaginary limitations fall by the wayside and are just gone. At this point, other than maybe the Third Amendment, every single amendment in the first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights, is violated every single day in every state in the Union by federal agents. It didn't work. It doesn't ever work. Didn't work in China, didn't work in Russia, didn't work here, won't ever work. Because what you're doing is saying, you are my Lord and Master, but you're not allowed to do A, B, and C. And your Lord and Master says, well, I'm going to appoint somebody that will tell me what I'm allowed to do. I'm allowed to do anything. Golly gee. How did that work out for you? <laughs> okay. I think that's a good point. We're deviating a little bit from voting concept, but it actually all kind of ties into each other. I do have a question from somebody, which I'm going to go a little bit away from my script. Um, but I think it all ties in together. So they say you suppose that the United States 
is oppressive, what would you consider the most oppressive regime in the world? So I'm going to throw this one to Hody. Um, obviously, we've talked about uh, democratic republics and how you think maybe the United States is a little bit different than other that other uh, democracies or republics that just claim that name. What do you think is the most um, oppressive regime in the world, and why? Sure, I <clears throat> I love that you went here because uh, let's, go with, feudal We're let's going go with feudalism. Let's go with feudalism a little bit because it's all yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm having beer. As far as far as a system or a specific regime goes, we're, I'm going to go with feudalism. Um, okay. Historian Thomas Notable actually noted that feudalism and the system that it describes is not actually uh, conceived as a form of political system. Um, by the people in the Middle Ages, it was simply just these guys had swords and these guys didn't. It was actually a result of the fallout of the Carolingian Empire. Um, these these individual fiefs actually, you know, they gained independence. And so there was no, oh, it's the power of the king or the power of, you know, the constitution grants me the right to do these things. There's none of that. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, while in the state of having no constitution, uh, no voting, no representation, and, and an opportunity to start as it was, uh, we actually developed what would become, and, and again, he can debate the numbers if he'd like to, and that's that's his right, but uh, this is this was Ooh. the most murderous, this is the most <laughs> murderous, um, uh, <laughs> state of living, living in human history, right, was under feudalism. Okay. Uh, historians A.R. Brown and um, Susan Reynolds, they note that feudalism is more akin to anarchy but it, because it's not ruled by anyone in any official capacity. It's not considered a government. There's no system of organization. It was just I, ha I happened to be the guy that had all the swords and I attacked these guys. So there's no system telling the rulers of these castles or fiefs what to do. There's no constitution demanding a practice of slavery or serfdom. There's no tax code that demands any percentage of anything be taken. They just simply okay. took what they felt like taken because they had the swords and, and everybody kind of agreed in this mutualistic way to say, yeah, I'll kill those guys if you want me to. And, and be, you know, they developed these systems. The idea that these won't, that these would not develop without these type of things. Um, anyway, specifically to the question, that's what I would say is the most oppressive and murderous in history, simply by the numbers that I've seen so far. Okay, I'm being a poor moderator and being a little partial. What's the difference between somebody that oppresses somebody in government? Like, sure. Oh, back to you're me. You're saying those people are. Anyways, anyway, sorry. Okay, I'm gonna run this over to Larkin because he's a lot smarter than I am. Sure. Um. So, what would you say in response to um that question of you know the United States does have um a constitution, we're a constitutional republic. And regardless if, if it's followed or the constitution is potent or not, um, we are not the most uh, egregious uh, government in the world. What would you say in response to that and to and Hody's response? Um, yeah, cur currently this isn't the worst in the world as long as you're here. If you're one of the millions of people being blown up by the US military, you might want to dispute that. If it was a while back and you were one of the people who were living here before the U.S. government said, we own this place, and you got slaughtered or forcibly evicted and, or had to do the trail of tears and all that, you might say, yeah, this is pretty darn bad. So for me, right here and right now, no, this isn't, this isn't at all the worst. However, it was a little bit weird that Hody is arguing with himself because his first three examples when he first was talking about horrible oppression were all constitutional republics. Now he's talking about feudalism, which is not at all the same thing. And he sort of left out the part that, yes, there absolutely was in a lot of cases. I'm not going to say it's every single case in the whole world in history. But in a lot of cases, there was very much the belief in authority and very much a belief in the divine right of kings. And then the kings give land to this person and it's their land because the king said so. Um, I haven't gotten to this yet. Most of the people who are familiar with my stuff already know it. the problem is the belief in authority. And whether it's a belief in a king or a constitutional republic, you're still imagining that somebody has the right to rule you. And the problem is still in the heads of the people who believe that. Now, currently, if you say what's the worst in the world right now, I think people in North Korea are North brainwashed Korea. Yeah. as much as you can get brainwashed. Mm -hmm. um, so that might be the, the, the current you know, worst, but the problem is all, and in those fiefdoms and, and feudalism, most acts of most aspects of most people's lives were not violently controlled by anybody 
it is only in the, the developing and, and with the development of, of technology and communication and all that, that government has ever been able to have its tentacles in anywhere near this many things. Under the rule of King George here, people were way more free than they are under a constitutional republic now. Okay, so I have, um, we strayed a little bit, but I think it's been a really good discussion and I'm not a fancy pants, so I like to stray. And if I wanna do, I'll do what I wanna do. Um, so, but I'm gonna go a little bit back to voting because I have a question. I have several here now that I'll probably deviate to later um, about voting. I've been on both sides of the issue I've said. Um, and so there's the uh, initial argument or response about an anarchist voting or, you know, even somebody like yourself, Hody, that's an anarchist. Um, is voting violence? So I'm going to direct this initially to you, Hody. My question would be, is voting violent and how does it directly affect your neighbor in the same way? Sure. With with the thousands of different kinds of voting there are, this would be difficult to summarize. Voting absolutely can be violent. Let's be very clear about that. It's been it's been okay. abused before. This is kind of similar to guns, right? Do I have the right as a collective to take everybody's stuff? Absolutely you do. Um, one of the more interesting tidbits throughout history, I guess, to, to wrap up the feudalism talk, would be that feudalism actually had a specific end date, which seems crazy, but August 4th, uh, 1789, 87, something like that. But uh, what it was is a national assembly. And what the people decided to get together and vote and say that we're sick of we're sick of cutting all this down. Yeah, it wasn't a government authorized vote because there was no government, right? So they just got together and said, hey, if we all, here's the, what happens is if I refuse to cut the wheat for you, I get murdered, right? I get cut down. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a vote with all my guys and say, let's stand all outside our houses together and let's all of us refuse. Now, if one person refused, they kill one, then the next guy says, okay, I'll cut the wheat. But if collectively you all agree together to say, I am not gonna stand for this oppression anymore, what happened is on that day of August 4th, they all stood outside their houses and said, none of us will cut your wheat. And you can either kill us all and have nothing because we're your means of production, or you can just make some kind of, you know, you're gonna have to make deals with us. You're gonna have to give us power. You're gonna have to, they actually got land. Um, received equal rights, things like that. Um, again, flaws, absolutely. Uh, but <clears throat> no violence, specifically, it actually stopped the violence of murder that was going around. Other part, it can be violent, but let's not, let's not make this mistake that all violence is bad, okay? If you show up on my property to take some of my things and I initiate violence against you, well, that's, that's, that's a good type of violence, I would say, that's self-defensive violence, right? We, we talk about authority being the right or power to coerce somebody. Yeah, I have the right and the power to coerce someone if they assault me, if they try to, you know, rape me or steal my things. And so if there is some law, whether it's legitimate or not, that says these people can uh, rape you or steal your things, and we decide to have a vote to say, no, you can't do that anymore. Yes, that law is illegitimate, of course. But if there's a mm -hmm. vote that can get rid of it, why would you not use that tool? Okay, I'm gonna cut you off there, Hody. So what would you say in response to his examples um, and the original question of is voting violence and how does it directly affect your neighbor? Larkin. Well, first to respond to his answer, it was a little bit funny because that's not voting. That's not politics. That is open disobedience. Um, another example being the Declaration of Independence. It wasn't a political act. It was a completely anti-political act saying we're just not going to obey you and we have the right to forcibly resist if you try to do it. And in that case, they tried to, you know, the, the British tried to violently conquer, and then there was people shooting each other back and forth. Sometimes you don't need that because people say, we're just not gonna obey you anymore. That's not voting. That's not voting for a master. It's not even like voting for whether we should do this because the number of people who disobey doesn't depend on the vote. In the American Revolution, most people did not resist British rule. It was about a third that actually bothered to resist. The vote didn't freaking matter. Majority didn't matter. Legislation didn't matter. Political action didn't matter. Disobedience mattered. And that is the precise, precise exact opposite of anything that begs government um, for permission or for lenience. Now, as far as whether voting is violence, um, Voting isn't an act of violence. It is an advocacy of violence. If you're talking about voting for anybody to have that power, 
Um, there's an exception if you're talking about like, well, I voted on a referendum just to oppose mm -hmm. this particular tax well, or whatever. I would actually, Go I'm going to interrupt on that because it's one of my questions and I don't want to cut your time short, but I feel like we've kind of covered that topic. Um, so a lot of uh, anarchists that vote, including myself, I, I do it very strategically. Um, and I don't vote for a lot of representatives, very rarely, actually. Um, I use it um, as a bullhorn and a platform. Um, and I vote on issues basically only. So what say you of issue voting? I'm going to throw this actually back to you, Larkin, first, and then I'm going to give Hody a longer time to respond. So if someone um, votes on issues, what do, do you think that is violent towards their neighbor? What are your thoughts on that? I have a, I have a, a degree less of, a, of an objection to that. If somebody's just voting like on a referendum against a particular act of government violence or control, um, my only complaint then is that, well, you're sort of legitimizing the process, but you know, you're not actually, you know, condoning anything evil against somebody else, as opposed to if you vote for a candidate who's going to tax anybody, you are advocating immoral violence and pointing to the other candidate and saying, well, he was going to be worse. Does it make it okay? It's the equivalent of saying, I want that guy to be your owner. And I said, I don't want an owner. Well, it was either him or the other guy. That's still you advocating my enslavement. That's not okay. Now, I usually call it advocacy of violence instead of actually an act of violence, mm -hmm. like hiring somebody to kill somebody right. instead of killing yourself. But if you are voting for somebody to exert power over me, you committed an immoral act and saying, well, something else worse would have, ha would have happened if I hadn't is not an excuse. It's like stealing my car keys and my wallet and saying, well, somebody else would have stolen your car if I didn't, doesn't make it okay. But if you're just voting against a particular act of authoritarian control, I don't have the, the same objection to it because you're not trying to give anybody power over me. Okay, so that begs a question and I'm gonna be a little bit, um, not gonna be fancy pants here and I'm gonna flip the question a little bit to Hody. Um, so I think we probably agree on issue voting, which is basically what I do as a voter. Um, uh, but what would you say in response as to voting for a candidate, what Larkin said? Could you give me uh, an argument against his ideas of voting for a candidate? Well, certainly. So this is one of those, um, again, if you're particular about the way you vote and vote, voting has a certain ethic, I'm glad that Larkin at least see voting in some capacity because that's really all I was going for. I'm not defending every vote. I'm not defending a vote to steal people's stuff and everything like that. But um, let me at least try to, to defend the position. Um, this is from the Anarchist Library, actually, and they probably defend voting a lot better than I do. So a vote is held to sustain the police. Um, anarchist societies have replaced professional military and popular forces with a part-time popular militia, which looks out for the safety of the community. Um, and then elected officials, this military would take a person accused of a crime and their accuser before a popular tribunal, where any dispute could be arbitrated and the criminal act could be adjudicated and rectified. Um, in determining if the rights have been infringed upon, the tribunal would function much like a jury in hearing evidence and making a decision based on that evidence. Um, of course, we know what popular is. How do you find out what's popular? You vote on it. You know, this is how we stop the, you know, <laughs> rapist from saying, you know, we, we say, oh, you know, in an anarchist society, we can fire, or you, we always say this, you can fire the police whenever you want. Well, obviously, if I'm a child rapist, I say, well, all the police are fired and I own a lot of land and I have 50 kids on my land that I rape. So, you know, I have fired the police. Well, of course that doesn't work. And in this anarchist mm -hmm. society, at least according to the anarchist library, and I don't expect Larkin to, to defend what they say, he has his own views. He came to anarchy in his own way. But I'm simply saying that this is the way anarchists would justify voting for somebody to sit on that tribunal. Hmm. That's actually quite a, like a third eye response, Hody. I'm kind of impressed by your minarchist ass saying that. Um, <laughs> I think that point, we've gotten around that so much. Um, I don't think there will be a conclusion to that. So I want to ask a different point. I've got some cool questions from people in the audience. Um, <laughs> this one is too provocative. So I'm going to go back to one of mine. Um, so this would be in a bit of a defense of somebody that's an anarchist that votes. 
What do you think about voting? And, and I think Rothbard and Spooner um, both made intellectual arguments for this. And this is not saying every anarchist has to fall in line with Rothbard or Spooner. I think that's a very stupid argument. But those are really intelligent men that I have followed. They say that voting is self-defense and it's using the system against itself. I would toss that to you, Larkin. What do you think the fallacies are on that or do you not? That is a gigantic error. <laughs> oh, um, shit. <laughs> Lysander Spooner. Well, I would love to, to, to dig him up, bring him back to life, and argue with him about specifics of exactly what he meant. Because if you think that it counts as defensive and moral to try to appoint an authoritarian master because he's not quite as bad as the other choice, then the only thing the rulers ever have to do is give you mm, Trump and Hillary. And you'll have <laughs> half the country voting for one psychotic authoritarian collectivist warmonger and the other side voting for the other psychotic authoritarian collectivist warmonger, all of them advocating by way of their vote, violent, evil, oppressive, authoritarian domination. And all you have to do to trick people into doing that, including a bunch of people who, who call themselves anarchists or, or minarchists or whatever else, is make something even worse. So it's like, we want the people to cheer for this stupid, immoral, collectivist, authoritarian, bogus tyranny. And the way to do it is to run it against something even worse. If you advocate immoral, violent, authoritarian aggression, you did something immoral. Don't tell me that if you hadn't have done that immoral thing, something worse would have happened to me because it wouldn't be your freaking fault if something worse happened to me. It is your freaking fault if the authoritarian person you put into power takes my money and my freedom and telling me it would have been even worse is pathetic. And this is an argument you see constantly between the Trumpites and the Democrats. Well, just be thankful it isn't the other person stealing your money and, and violating your rights and controlling your life. No. I am only thankful for the people in the world who refrain from trying to put anybody in a position where they can violently dominate me, dominate me and steal my crap, not the people who do it and say, well, it would have been worse if I didn't. That is a bullshit excuse for advocating immoral authoritarian control. Well, hot damn and holy shit. I'm going to throw that right back. I said I wasn't going to swear, but I did. Um, so I think Larkin feels very passionately about that. Um, so, Hody, yeah. I'm sure that you're intelligent enough to have listened to his full argument, so I don't need to recap it for you. Give me your response. Sure. Well, I don't think he's necessarily wrong, right? Anybody who's advocating for authoritarianism, I think he and I would see uh, statism as a little bit differently, but especially, you know, authoritarianism or willingness to, to assault somebody. You know, um, Thomas Paine went through the idea that... Uh, uh, that that the go that governments can only exist based on charters of negativity, right? Things that they should not be able to do their, to their populace, you know. And that's the only way in the, which they have the right to exist. Now they pop up regardless, right? And this is this is one of the issues mm -hmm. that we have. So one of the one of the big things that I guess I'd poke at. Uh, a lot of people refer to my position as as unprincipled simply because they say, well, how many uh, how many dog turds would you like in your cereal, or how much cancer would you like your doctor to remove? Only ninety nine percent. Only ninety. Look, it's a cute analogy, but it doesn't work in the real world, right? Let's say, let's say poison, right? Let's say let's say arsenic, right? This is the way I view a lot of a lot of government, right? Is arsenic. So if I say, well, I want no arsenic, no poison, all poison is bad. Every bit of poison is bad. And if you advocate for poison, you're evil. Okay, but zero percent arsenic in your diet and your dead meat, because you need just a touch in order to get the the uh, metals out of your blood right it acts as a filter so so the thing is is i'm not going to say that there's a utopian sweet spot right there's always some type of negativity i just think that somewhere between feudalism and north korea there's probably some place that's a little that we're a little bit better off with you know and so specific to defensive voting which is the original question um that that this is what i would advocate for that if you say these people say they, they, or these people are taking my stuff and we don't say we have the right. This is my argument for voting, right? You can say, well, that's not voting, that's disobedience. Look, it was called the National Assembly. They held a vote. The people said, well, we risk our lives if we all stand outside the door, outside our doors. What if they kill us? What if they kill us all anyway? What if I get my neighbor killed because they decide to kill everybody? 
And so they still had a vote. And so you could say, oh, well, I advocate that because that's not technically voting. Look, there was a raising of hands. There's yeas and nays. And ultimately, for me, that's voting. Defensive voting, yes, but it worked out. Hmm. Okay. I uh, I can't hear your audio, Hody. Your audio is oh, no? off. Okay, you're back. Okay. Okay. You just look very fervent on my Facebook Live, um, which is probably delayed, so that's probably the problem. Um, okay. So we have some very interesting questions live, which I probably won't ask a lot of those. <laughs> so um, it goes to the point, a lot of um, anarchists that I know that maybe are involved in the uh, Libertarian Party or whatever say that, well, this is a very provocative question, so I hope you boys are ready. Um, that liberty can be used as a platform and a bullhorn. So Ron Paul used this to hit his advantage in 2008 and 2012 and brought over a lot of people to a different way of thinking. Whether or not he had a chance, and I think he knew that he didn't have a chance, um, he used the political platform to change people's mind. Larkin, I'm going to throw this to you. What do you think of Ron Paul's run, and do you think that it legitimately – legitimately made a difference in the liberty movement. Go. I agree almost entirely with Ron Paul's assessment of Ron Paul's run. His closing remarks on the House floor, the last thing he said in front, in front of that band of crooks, was brilliant. And I loved hearing him say it because it's what I had been saying about him for years. He basically said, and I'm paraphrasing, you can go look it up. It's an awesome thing to watch. He basically said, legislatively, I got nothing accomplished. Like that is not the way to win. Voting is not the way to get freedom. Politics is not the way to get freedom. What matters is what the people believe. He did do a great job of spreading a bunch of ideas that got people looking into it and yeah, that makes sense. And a bunch of people then kept thinking about stuff and <laughs> turned into anarchists. The mentality of the population is the thing that matters. The votes don't, the legislation doesn't. And he managed to help change a lot of minds or, or get a lot of minds started in the right direction. Um, but that had nothing to do with this, like him getting votes or not. You could say like the best you could say is, well, there were more people paying attention because he was an officer because he campaigned. And that's true. And you can like, but that, that isn't, a, that isn't like a reason to engage in voting and, and petitioning because he didn't, he didn't accomplish anything by way of legislation. And he said so. If that happens to be a way to get in front of people, fine. But notice that his, his agenda and his whole approach was not, if elected, I will save you all. His approach was the ideas, win or lose. Because by the way, he freaking lost. <laughs> oh, all that sadly. By losing. It didn't matter what his legislative agenda was. It didn't happen. It didn't matter what he would have done as president. He didn't get there. He had no chance to get there. It did matter the ideas he was spreading. And there's lots of other ways to get an audience. The thing is, the ultimate problem is not in Washington, D.C. It's not in the legislatures. And that's, I want to quick throw this in because this is my main point. And I don't okay. know if we're going to get, get to it in another point. We'll be uh, good. <laughs> the main problem with voting is not just that it never achieves freedom, although that's true. You are never going to vote for a government to not be there. The main problem is that it reinforces the notion that political rituals actually bestow upon somebody else the right to rule. That belief, the belief in authority, especially the belief in political authority, that is the entire problem. And voting and campaigning and petitioning, which, by the way, I did lots of before I gave up my own statism, all it does is use up the time and the energy and the money and the hope of good people and throw it into a black hole, all while reinforcing the notion that that is our only recourse. That's our only way to achieve freedom. Play the game that is a game of the tyrants, by the tyrants, and for the tyrants. Play it every four years, lose it every four years, and then go back and be a good slave for four more years instead of saying, what if we disobeyed? And if the mindset of the people was not focused on 
politics and voting and elections and legislation, but on disobedience, 10% of the population could end any regime in the world almost overnight, whereas 10% of the electorate accomplishes nothing. Okay. Um, you made some good points, but I think they're, might I say, and I'm not as intellectual as you are, you made a few points that I think that um, con or contradict each other. Um, so you're saying that a platform and a bullhorn make no difference and yet they do, and that voting uh, hurts people and yet it doesn't. If voting is impotent, how can it be in the same way violent? Um, and so I, I do not, I don't understand where you can dice, you can uh, transact the issues of voting being violent and voting hurting people <coughs> when um, it doesn't matter. So I'm going to throw that question to Hody. How can voting be the same as being violent against your neighbor and perpetuating the state? And how can it also be pointless? If you could maybe clarify that argument, because that's one of the things that I have the hardest time with. And I am not a um, uh, impartial uh, moderator. I have lots of views on this. So um, I tend to side with Larkin on a lot of things as an anarchist, but at this point, I, I probably diverge from him. So I would enjoy your point of view on this uh, point. Sure, let me make one thing clear, and this is something that Larkin is spot on. Uh, there is no substitution for culture. Right. right. Uh, there's something that Arvind Vohr is right, famous right. for saying, which okay. is if we deconstruct this entire government that we have, we'll just reconstruct it tomorrow. Right. One of the crazy things about feudalism is it popped up on both hemispheres of the world. It wasn't this political idea that you had to teach people. It was just something that happened. Right. We, it, it was just something that, that that was the stage that people were in and that's what they tend towards. Right. And so there's no substitution for this culture of freedom. Right. So these are important. Um, to, to gain this culture back, that's more important than the vote, right? I'm not going to advocate as a vo vote to fix it. Voting fixes everything. I found a few examples of voting fixing things and helping things, and I'll bring a couple more of those up right now. But I do want to say that he is spot on by saying this is not, voting does not replace ethics, right? This is not one of those things where all of a sudden we're ethical because we voted all the right things into office. Now, let, let's start by votes that happen currently. Okay, now there are some, obviously there's a lot Lot of marijuana bills okay and and i think this is important to understand because some <laughs> of them introduce additional regulations right absolutely no doubt but they are first and foremost non-enforcement clauses because the states can't illegalize marijuana or can't legalize marijuana they can only not enforce the feds rules and so when this oh, is placed to a vote what you are saying amendment. is that i am <laughs> is that i am not right this is what this is saying is i'm not going to enforce your rules Okay, so this is this is the state's right of saying, uh, remember when Andrew Jackson was like, oh, it's their Supreme Court, let them send it. This is the state's response. Oh, it's the, it's the federal, it's the feds rules, let them enforce it. You know, we're not gonna enforce it. This is why when you're still in a state where like weed is legal, there's like, yeah, by the way, if you're still in an, like an interstate area where like there's federal cops and stuff, don't, don't, don't toke up, right? <laughs> it doesn't matter that you're in our state. Okay, so, so let's start with that. And let's also start by saying he, he did establish that, um, what, but talking about how there's very little freedom to, to be gained or no freedom to be gained by it. Look, if you're someone who's been escorted out of the country against their will, they've even done it to legal citizens, um, mm -hmm. we've, we've begun voting against that in certain states, right? And this is, this is purely saying you don't have the right to go on somebody's property. Now, it's establishing the right you don't have to go on their property and kick them out. Because Larkin and I would agree that you should have that right regardless, you know. But it is what it is is saying, hey, by the way, if you do it, these people can blow your brains out now. And we're not going to, there's no tears shed, right? Because you are trying to kick them out of the country. That's now something that we're going to stand behind them on, much like this National Assembly. Yes, all it did was saying we're going to stop doing this now. But yeah, but that means a lot, right? That 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 solidarity through voting actually does mean quite a bit. So I'm not going to advocate every instance of voting. Let's let's go over a couple. I can mm -hmm. get a, a lot of time, so I'm going to take a little bit of extra time here as well. Ooh. Let's talk about some anarchists <laughs> that were into the vote as well, right? Benjamin Tucker um, said this um, said anarchy does not exclude prisons, officials, military, other symbols of force. It merely demands that non-invasive men shall be made the victims of such force. Anarchism is not the reign of love, but the reign of justice. 
It does not signify the abolition of force symbols, but the application of force to real invaders. And how do we decide on who the real invaders are? By vote is his claim, but obviously you can say something else, but this is his solution to it when they say people are surrounding us. Now this, this actually happened in the Ukraine. They fought a successful war, non-conscription, with anarchy, right? And they and they fought and they got their own land. But when then people homesteaded them, right? The 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 commies surrounded them, mm -hmm. surrounded their border. Everybody recognized that this was going to be a a barricade, right? And barricade them in and stop their trade and stop their supplies and start starving them to death and occupy their homes. But they had no system of which to defend themselves against it and they were morally opposed to voting. So they didn't recognize that as some type of uh, of aggression until it was too late. Now what they ended up doing was hiring or not hiring, electing representatives from after that point to say like, hey look, the Holodomor killed five million people. They starved five million people in the Ukraine, anarchists, right? Because they didn't because they couldn't defend themselves. They didn't have a system in the place to do that. Right. And so they said what we need is a system that says, hey, I'm recognizing a danger we should do something about. The militia was still voluntary, right? but they mm -hmm. still elected some representatives to recognize foreign threats. So uh, that that's how I'd respond to that. Oh, okay. Um, well, I might have, so I kind of go back and forth. And like I said, I'm not completely impartial. I'm trying to be fair, but I have my own ideas. Um, and so I would say that a government is anybody that rules other people by force. So saying something that doesn't come from a government doesn't necessarily doesn't mean it doesn't. Anyways, I have another question. I've listened to a lot of the questions online and people are very bold in their butt heads. Online? So no. My, no. Are you serious? Um, so I'm going to stick, I'm going to stay with my outline until I see something more reasonable. <laughs> um, not that I don't appreciate you guys commenting. That's awesome. If somebody wants to pose a really serious, cool question, I'm super cool with like deviating from my outline and going with it. So far, it's just anger. Um, anyways, so um, we talked about the vote, the ish, the system, like using the system against itself, voting as violence. How does it affect your neighbor? Um, because so here's something about um, just the philosophy of voting, which I looked a little into and did some prep for this debate. As you can tell, I'm super intellectual and fancy, so <laughs> I'm super ready. Um, <laughs> because voting grants legitimacy to the current political system and directs attention away from direct action. Okay, so I actually found that in an article of somebody that was against voting. Um, and I thought it was an interesting concept. Do you think that voting in and of itself grants legitimacy to the current political system and directs attention away from actual action as far as maybe um, informing your neighbors, like taking action against the state, anything like that. So I'm going to throw that to Larkin, obviously. Yeah, and that was convenient that you just made one of my arguments for me, is oh. <laughs> when, people, when people are distracted into thinking that the solution is by way of politics and voting, what they're doing is asking for the permission of the ruling class to have a little bit more freedom here and there. And in doing so, they are very loudly proclaiming that they acknowledge that it's the ruling class's choice to decide that, which is them saying, I acknowledge that you are my Lord and master and I have to obey you. Now, will you please change your, change your commands a little bit or your demands or whatever it is? you are absolutely legitimizing their imaginary authority over you. And not only does that not have a great track record of success, it wastes the energy and the effort that you could have used to actually disobey the amount of power. And, and when he mentioned the, the cultural thing, yeah, what matters is what's between the ears of you know millions or billions of people, what they believe voting and playing politics strengthens the idea that politics creates a legitimate ruling class and it's funny because the the examples he's going back and forth between are are not at all the same they're fundamentally different a bunch of people who say those buttheads over there are trying to control us um are we ready to forcibly resist that kind of vote isn't legislation and it's not democracy it's just 
do we dare to go kick their butts or not? It's not because we're legislatively creating a new right or overruling a blah, blah, blah of political authority. It's just people understanding that their own conscience determines right and wrong and votes and legislation and politics don't. And then they decide what to do about it. And the thing is, if you can get your subjects to imagine that the, the proper civilized moral way to deal with being oppressed is to vote and beg and petition and campaign and do all that, you can get away with way more injustice, which is why you see them getting away with way more injustice when they say, we represent the people, like the Soviet Union did in Red China and, and the US and a bunch of other places. Mm -hmm. They pretend we're representing you. It's a republic. You vote for us and blah, blah, blah. And the only difference between the Soviet Union and here is the propagandists here were smart enough to put up two puppets, whereas in the Soviet Union, you had one. So everyone says, this election's a joke. But if you put up okay. two, people go, well, now it's legitimate. No, it's not. It's just twice the joke but it's still all people legitimizing the game instead of disobeying. And an example I like to use is if the people who now vote libertarian and accomplish pretty much nothing in the process, you're never going to get a libertarian president. You don't even get a libertarian candidate in the libertarian party. Every single one of their candidates advocates violent extortion in the form of taxation. They just advocate less of it. So none of them are even libertarians. If you ran a libertarian, he would never get there. Oh, if the people shit. who vote libertarian said, screw this, I'm not voting, and I'm not giving the damn IRS my money anymore, that is the end of the federal income tax. Because if you got 10, 15 million people to say, we're just going to openly disobey and resist, there is nothing in the world, 100,000 paper pushes that the IRS could do to 15 million people just going, uh-uh, we're not complying anymore. But if you can get them to vote oh. instead, they accomplish nothing and they keep being willing slaves. Okay, so I I appreciate a lot of your points and they were really interesting. Um, so do you, Larkin, I'm gonna throw this question to Hody, but I'm actually reposing this question. So do you honestly believe that if 10 to 15 million people stop paying taxes, the state would abdicate itself in the form of taxation. They don't have to abdicate um, themselves. Okay. We abdicate themselves for them. That's the whole point is we don't need their permission. They don't have the ability. Now, see, I'm not being the moderator right now. I'm arguing with you, which is really bad. So I'm going to drink <laughs> some more right. beer. I'm going to throw this over to Hody, who's a lot smarter than me. But I want to fight you on this, so I'm just going to message you about it. Um, so, Hody, <laughs> this is it. So, Hody, what say you in your response? Sure. So, first things first. If you decide not to vote, not to show up, they don't need you. You count towards their towards their counts, right? And every representative reps represents X number of people. And yeah, they gerrymander, and even when they don't illegally gerrymander, they draw the population lines to say you should have this much population, you should have this much, you should have this much, and so on. So, if you live there. They're your representative, whether you say so or not. Now, you could say, that's not my representative. I didn't vote for him. But that's not going <laughs> to stop him from squishing you, right? And so this is the thing. Are we voting for less evil of masters oftentimes? Absolutely, right? And we shouldn't, we, we should, we want better choices, right? And this is where the culture war comes in. We do need a culture war. We do need to say, hey, people, you need to change your values over here. Don't you see that the right and left has been squishing you forever? Republicans were pulling in 2%. They were just like Larkin said, you could laugh at them forever. They're pulling 2%, 3% until the whole country falls apart. And they're like, oh, crud, we need somebody with real solutions. All right. You know, and so what we want to do is be that party that says, all right. You know, now, even if you don't refuse to join the Libertarian Party, this is something I want to establish right now. Whatever your conscience tells you is more important intellectually than anything Larkin or I could tell you. Okay, mm -hmm. now, because here's the thing, here's the thing, and, and I want to make this very clear. I have a great deal of respect for Larkin. I imagine that it's too bad that we meet in this debate format because he and I would agree on, on, on a lot, right? I would agree. And so this is, this is the thing, is that we are good, we are good allies. Now, he might disagree uh, if he says, you know, everybody that advocates any amount of, of arsenic, you know, we, we should, you know, die of metal in our bloodstreams, you know, statism. Is, is is not a good ally to me. Well, I would disagree. If I could interrupt I Hody, which friends. is yeah. Hody, if I could interrupt, which is poor um, debate tactics, 
but I would say that um, I will argue somebody that advocates violence against me all day. And then the people that advocate really small violence, I'll do with them in the end. So you beat one of those people in the end. <laughs> so Perhaps. You I know, that's... That, that's... <laughs> That's one of the one of the thoughts. Now, look, I, I, I have also demonstrated times in voting has advocated literally no violence at all, or even the ability to use violence against your oppressor. Now, as Larkin states, you already have that right. You're just asserting it, you know. And this is what voting mm -hmm. is does is we say, hey, we we have this right. We look around, we agree with each other. Now, uh, to the point on if we stop paying the IRS money, would they would they abdicate government? Absolutely not, right? Because they control, they print. They print the money. They, print, they they run the Fed, right? This is so money is not the concern. Now they would have a problem with the things that money can buy, right? Like tanks and mm -hmm. and whatnot, like that. They need to conscript people. They need people to do that. But they really only need a very small number of people. And this is feudalism all over again, right? We only need a couple of knights and a couple of henchmen to rule people that are thousands of times larger than us, right? So as long mm -hmm. as you can find those people, you're going to be okay, right? And even if you can't pay them with money, which they would still be able to, because here's the thing, the money goes from the government to the people, and then some of it back to the government again, right? Because this is what we do. This is our national income equation. This is a Keynesian uh, economics equation, right? That we that we recently adopted and all the other big countries in the world adopted at the same time because surprise, surprise, it looked pretty enticing, right? With this national bank thing. As these national banks begin to fall apart and we've seen this happen around the world, they're beginning to explore libertarian alternatives, you know, or, or um, e even anarchist alternatives, right? And where they're becoming, as opposed to being the fourth or fifth minor party, they're actually becoming the second, third, or even first, you know, mm -hmm. in line. And so, and this is what we're really going for. But the thing is those governments don't need them you know they don't need them to show up or not you know there what's the difference between somebody morally doesn't show up to vote and somebody who just doesn't care enough to vote ultimately you're in that same gerrymandered circle you know and they're just going to keep representing you okay so we've had a really great um audience and i'm going to give a couple shout outs and i want both of you to but i want to wrap things up um, with a really um, interesting question for you guys both. <clears throat> and I want it to come from the heart because I'm a girl and I like emotions. Um, <laughs> so there are a lot of people in the liberty movement um, that may not see eye to eye. Um, and I think obviously both of you being intelligent, well-informed guys, one of you believing in something, one of you not, um, can understand that. So, in that vein, what do you think, if you think it, at, of it at all, what would you think of people that believe in libertarian ideals but are maybe small status, like minarchists, and people that are anarchists, do you think there is a way for us to come together to help open uh, hearts and minds? Do you think that's a possibility? Or do you think we will just argue into a continuum? I'm going to give that to Larkin. Um, I, I'm going to be really blunt here. I think okay. minarchists are not at all helping the cause of liberty. Um, libertarian minarchism was tried. The U.S. Constitution was a brilliant try at that. It made the biggest authoritarian empire in the history of the, history of the world. We don't need better choices at who should be on the throne. We need people to figure out the only choice that's moral and rational is don't have a freaking throne. And every time you put a throne there, it doesn't matter how you campaign it, how you sell it, how you pitch it, what the constitution says to begin with, you are creating a ruling class. You are declaring that somebody has the right to rule. And as soon as you do that, you have planted a seed that will grow. The anti-federalists knew it. All their predictions about how monstrous the US government was gonna turn into, they, they were wrong in the direction that it was way worse than they even said it was going to be. If minarchists got their way and we got the constitution all over again, which will never happen in a million years, it would come back. <laughs> yeah. What we have today is the result of minarchism. It doesn't freaking work. There's not such thing as a nice legitimate slave master. There is freedom or there is slavery and bickering over who should be our slave master doesn't ever, ever lead to freedom. It leads to worse and worse and worse slave masters all the way down the road. So as long as somebody advocates 
a little tiny slave master, to me, he is just as much an obstacle to true freedom as an outright socialist or an outright Nazi, because he agrees with them in that I should be beholden to a ruling class. He just wants it to be a nicer ruling class. But that is the myth. That is the superstition that has to go. We don't ever get to freedom until the entire notion of political authority is gone. Well, hallelujah and holy shit. All right. <laughs> We're going to go, um, I'm going to point that argument to you, Hody, but I'm going to essentially um, ask you, um, I know you listened to what Larkin said. How do you think any type of small government society would benefit the individual? Do you think it would help shrink the state? Just like going with his arguments, just give me a good argument for a minarchist society. Well, certainly. So the anarchists do it well enough themselves. Uh, some of the guys like Yaros and uh, Josiah Warren, as they went west and established anarchist societies, found that they weren't able to stand up uh, to, to the to the sprawl of the government or to the allure of the government as it went west. Um, the one that has actually lasted until today is a little place called Utopia, which they managed to. It was again something I was going to bring up, but uh, something that that was protected because uh, of. Uh, they, they were maintained the condition to be able to vote to join the union, and they've re, uh, repeatedly voted against it. Um, now, look, I am not going to talk about all the anarchist paradises like Jamaica in 1720, uh, you know, Spain in 1936, Albania in 1997, Somalia for those 15 years, you know, and and. and Look, Somalia. <laughs> yeah, you know, Somalia, you know, where where they had four different four different groups and and the the anarchist group kept itself alive through piracy and child prostitution. You know, and and I just don't I, for me that's not where I stand. You know, and I and I don't I I again with the poison analogy. I understand there's some purity to what he's saying. Now, I'm going to answer that I want to answer the first part still, though, directly while I disagree with him. Okay. Now, it was, uh, it was um, Dale Patrick Moynihan who said everyone's tied to their own opinions but not their own facts. Okay. I went back. I looked it up because I had time, right? Internet age and all. Uh, North Korea, unitary. China, unitary. Old USSR, unitary. So let's get that mm -hmm. established as well, right? Those are, those are very different than what, than what we have today in the United States. Now, again, Imperfections, absolutely. Problems with government, absolutely. But when we draw absolutes, these are the problems that come about. It's somewhere in between feudalism, right? And somewhere in between North Korea, okay? And so this is a goal. Here's the thing, Thomas Hobbes, this is not an easy question, what we got about voting, right? Thomas Hobbes wrote the Leviathan because of this subject. It, he drove himself insane. So I don't need to tell you it's a difficult subject, right? You read that and he's like, uh, what, what do you say? It followeth in such a condition that every man has a right to everything, even to another's body. And therefore, as long as this natural right of every man to everything endureth, there can be no security to any man of living out of the time which nature ordinarily allow men to live. And he cites the war against all, where he talks about um, life being uh, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short on either end of the, pr of the spectrum. Right. And so mm -hmm. what we're going for, again, there's no utopias, but something in between. Now, I do want to address your first question. I see, Lark okay. Lark I see, I, I am very different from Larkin in this, is that I do see him okay. as a useful person and as an ally to the cause. I see minarchists, I see anarchists, I see the libertarian socialists, I see anybody that advocates freedom and liberty and the maximization of those prosperities as, as an ally to this to against authoritarianism right and if you want to do it through the vote great and if you don't want to do it through the vote great look i'm not here to tell you what to do there's super smart people that agree with me that i'm representing in this debate and there's super smart people that larkin's representing that agree with him right i did my homework and found a few anarchists that agree with me i'm sure he's going to find those that agree with him and we can have this intellectual debate all day but ultimately this last question that you're asking is the most important is can we unify against authoritarianism against slavery against um, let's see, your child rapists against homesteaders, right? Against uh, against all of this, and we absolutely can. And, and and I've cited some evidence in history, and it's too bad that these debates are so short because there's even more of it, right? But at time to time, when we say I don't see eye to eye with my neighbor, we might be different religions, we might be different political faith, you know, philosophies. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to stand outside my door, 
and I want my neighbor to stand out his outside his door door too, regardless of where we stand on the issues, and say I'm not cutting this grain for you anymore, right? Because I, I mean I'm against taxation all the way as well, right? And say I'm not I'm not doing this anymore. You no longer have the right to rape people who get married, right? You have no longer have the right to that first night, right? You never had it, and I'm declaring that you don't. And anybody else who says that the government doesn't have that choice is an ally to me because there's way too much of it going around and it's time that we say enough and it is way too small a world for us to to divide into our own houses because that's how feudalism continued unification is how feudalism ends i think that's pretty fucking awesome hody <laughs> i'm gonna be honest thank you um so I know, Larkin, you've got this smug face. <laughs> Just my face. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, I only have I one think, sentence more to say. Okay, well, I probably wrap it up with your sentence and a sentence from Hody, and then I'm going to give a couple shout outs to some things. So tell me your thoughts, Larkin. The answer is not between the slavery of feudalism and the slavery of constitutional republics. The answer is move off the whole freaking line of authoritarianism to freedom. There is an answer. There isn't an answer anywhere on the line between slavery and other slavery. None of those are freedom. So you believe no political action and no line of thinking in the way of working with state would ever work. Asking for permission doesn't work and it, it tells them that you think it's their choice what to do to you. When people that. understand freedom, the game falls apart because it all it all rests on the imagination of the people thinking that it's legitimate. Because I, again, I wish we had more time um, because the notion that a hundred million gun owners could be forcibly controlled by a few nights is absurd. If the yep. American people ever believe in freedom, there is no force on the planet that will oppress them another day. So here's something I'm going to plug. It's a personal belief and part of why I do what I do. Um, and I'm going to just pose uh, this. It's not necessarily a question, um, but it's just what I believe. I'm going to ask you and Hody to respond. I definitely believe that you can have a platform and a bullhorn in the political uh, arena. But I think that uh, being an anarchist that is opposed to the state, the very best thing you can do is to meet individuals on the field of ideas and change their minds, not through force or being an asshole, but through planting seeds. And so that's the way that I approach things. I think that the way that we can change society comes through individuals, like meeting individuals on the field of idea. I don't know if that's a utopian idea or not. It's what I believe. So I'm going to throw that first to Hody. And what do you think about changing individual perspective and changing the world? So as far as changing the world goes, I mean, this is just, like I said, it, it's more about the culture. You're talking about the field of ideas, right? This is what mm -hmm. we talk about, it is, sure. is we need to change their minds and get them to understand. They always had the power to say, I'm not doing it anymore, right? The Ameri like he, Larkin's talking about the American gun owners. That's my point exactly. We all have the power to just say, I'm not doing it anymore. I'm not paying my taxes anymore. I'm refusing now. I'm not no longer I'm revoking uh, what what's it uh, this illusion of consent that I gave you right you never had any right to do it but I'm now enforcing that right you know to say that you never had that um, and so th that is where we want to get to is get pe between people's ears as Larkin said uh, ab absolutely agree with him on on that regard um, I guess I don't really have anything to say to disagree with that um, it sounded like we we're gonna wrap up but we're not so do you want me to say a thing or two about wrapping up or, or do you want to just no go over to Larkin no Hody okay. um, so I'm gonna go to Larkin to um, about uh, the last point about um, which is one of my um, it's a point that's very near and dear to my heart as I was a very big status and probably you guys were too at one point um, most people that come to Liberty were status at one point. We're not, unfortunately we're born being free, but we are indoctrinated to another system. Um, 
but I would ask him about the whole point of changing hearts and minds as being a way to move forward instead of like using government or voting. Cause I think even if I use issue voting, it has much, much less of an effect than me like talking to somebody and maybe planting seeds of liberty. So I'm gonna ask Larkin about that and then we're all gonna close on maybe like uh, advocating for some projects or whatever we wanna do, maybe some silly fun. So Larkin, what do you think about um, the future of anarchy and liberty? Do you think it depends more on like a large platform or the individual basis? Well, as it happens, my answer to that question can be my closing and my plug all in one shot. Um, I absolutely think that that the, the solution is changing people's minds and because the solution is doing away with the superstition of authority entirely. Um, I'm also a big believer in doing that in a whole bunch of different ways. When I do it in public, I'm not shy or gentle about it. As you may have noticed, I'm blunt and I do debate. <laughs> and all the way on the other side of the spectrum, um, Amanda and I do a seminar called Candles in the Dark, which is how to have one-on-one -on -one discussions that are completely the opposite of this, where it's totally <laughs> passive and you're basically gently bringing out of the person, the anarchist mm -hmm. that's already in them anyway, um, because, it, Deep inside, that yeah. is what resonates with people's understanding. And then there's the mythology that was that was dumped on top. Yeah. So yeah, changing people's minds because the minds of the people is the entire problem and the entire solution. Mm -hmm. Government is the thing over there that exists because people believe in authority. When they don't, it goes away. So for the plug, I would mention that down at uh, Anarchapulco and then Anarchaforco, which is happening right after it, this is February, um, yes. Amanda and I are going to be doing two candles in the dark um, seminars, one on the 12th and 13th and one about awesome. a week later, um, where we teach a completely different way <laughs> to get people to look at these ideas mm -hmm. that isn't debating and arguing, which I also love right. to do. And I actually right. think the different approaches are helpful for different people because some people yeah. like the, the combat mm -hmm. of ideas and they like the debating and other people just want to be gently invited to see what they kind of already know anyway, which is don't attack people, don't boss people around, don't take their stuff, and maybe don't ask somebody else to do it on your behalf. The end. Right. So yes. that's it for me. That's that awesome. No, <laughs> I, I think that's awesome. I love that you all are doing that. Um, I think it's super cool. And anybody that doesn't know about Anarcho Poco, maybe look into it. Um, and I kind of mostly try to take the stance in my personal life and it's somewhat on social media of just trying to plant seeds and not being a, an asshole because there's plenty of those. But there's a, a definitely a time and space for fun argument and disagreement, which we've what we've had. So I'm going to throw that back to Hody for our closing. And then I'm going to give a shout out um, to a couple of pages that I want people to follow. And if you like me and um, you like what has happened here, then you should follow those pages or I'll kick your ass. So, Hody, what say you in response to human action? Sure. So I just want to say that if you're following this debate, I hope that neither of us, well, I hope that I didn't come off as rude. I know Larkin didn't come off as rude. No, neither um, of you did. This is simply, this is a, this is a presentation <laughs> of ideas, right? Yeah. What, what, what debate is, and this is one of the most important things that I learned during speech and debate, this is not a war, right? Because like I said, there's always somebody smarter than you believes it's something different than you. Thomas Hobbes had such a debate with himself on the issue that he drove himself mad, right? And that included guys like, I mean, Tom, founding fathers like Thomas Paine and George Mason mm -hmm. struggled with this issue. This is not cut and dry. If you think that one or the other of us is looking stupid or silly or dumb, you're stupid and silly and dumb. Right. The, the subject is always complex. Right. None, none of it is cut and dry. Now, you may have formulated your opinion. You may have felt that one of us stated the opinion better than the other one. And that's fine. Right. That's how you do win in speech and debate after all. But ultimately, that's not what especially in this form, that's not what I'm going for. I was never at war with Larkin Rose. Like I said, I, I, I identify him as an ally. You agree with me half of the time when we talk about voting and not the other half of the time we talk about anarchy versus minarchy but that's okay right we're good friends and we and we throw these ideas out there because we do what that does is that develops people that makes their minds bigger i hope that people have learned most 
more about both sides of this of the position of voting more than what they knew before because then that's more weapons in their arsenal and more ability that they have to stand up against oppressors you know in in in, in various formats whether it includes voting or not but it makes you a more complete person which makes you a better soldier against indoctrination simply because you are more informed now there's a lot that we didn't get to um a lot of quotes a lot of history a lot of stories and it could go on and on. Larkin could go on for longer. So I'm not saying, oh, I could have gone on for longer. <laughs> Believe me, I've seen him we go on for all. longer. I know he could have like, gone on for I got like five pages, but, you know, right. I got a pee. Right, but, t you know, time's time and attention's attention. But I just really hope <laughs> yeah. that, you know, I'm just going to make a plea to the listener. I hope you just really got something out of it besides empty, uh, empty warmongering. We're not demagogues. Yeah. Okay, we're not here to say listen to me and not to this person. I think you should be listening to multiple points of view on every issue and shouldn't be listening to, to either him or me on just everything because that's when you turn into a demagogue yourself, right? And you, you turn into an NPC and we don't want that. We're not an NPC culture over here. So I just, I guess the plug that I'll throw, please listen to We're Libertarians. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's our network. Um, like I said, we, ha we have the anarchists on there. We have the, the, the socials on there. We have the minarchists on there. We have, you know, we, we are definitely against the authoritarianism but we'd like to cast a wide net as possible and um and i just I, i'm really grateful to everybody who did show up to support this and larkin for doing the debate trisha for hosting patrick smith i thank you so much for organizing this oh format. he's badass fantastic. isn't he yeah oh i'm yeah. hiring I just, him now i'm <laughs> hiring him <laughs> I just want to say thank you to all, all you guys for making this happen because this really was a thrill. I was looking forward to it for a while and I don't think it disappointed. Well, I want to um, ask the host just uh, thank you both. It was really fun. I wish we could go on forever, but Facebook Lives need to be shut off at some time. Um, and I do want to give a uh, shout out um, to a lot of people who've supported. I also want to tell you all um, there's some pages. I, I run meme pages because I'm a libertarian and that's what we do apparently. Um, and I do run some content pages, but I also want to give a shout out um, to uh, something I shared earlier, which is on the police to police 2.0, which if you don't like that page, you're a freaking commie bootlicker. Please go like police to police 2.0. They're a large police account accountability page. And I did link a fund for a guy earlier who needs some help hiring a lawyer to fight the state. So if you could go back on my page and look at that, that'd be awesome. Um, so thank you so much, Larkin and Hody. I know you're both super busy and um, to give time for this was really fun. I think it was a really well-formed argument. I'm not gonna say there was a winner or a loser, even though I know there's one in my mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I didn't take a ton of questions from there because they were really one-sided and maybe a little creepy. <laughs> but I think it was a good discussion. Oh, uh, Hody, hey, I don't know what's going on behind your head, Hody. Those headphones are badass. Um, so thank you both so much. Peace. And fuck the state.